Hello students, this is Mr. Martyrone coming to you. This is our flip classroom on classical Greece beginning in 550 BCE. So you guys want to have at your Cornell notes and in this video we're going to take a look at the geography of classical Greece. We're going to look at the accomplishments of the ancient Greeks. We're going to compare and contrast Sparta versus Athens. We're going to look at two individuals, King Philip of Macedonia and his son Alexander the Great. So let's get started. All right. First thing that is unique about Greece is it is located at the southern tip of Europe. What's also unique about it is that it is right across from Asia, what is now Turkey. So it's a natural bridge between modern day Europe and the Middle East. And we know that there's a lot of turmoil going on in the Middle East in this day and age. So Europeans are watching uh, what's going on in the issues of modern Greece very, very carefully. Geographically to the east is the, excuse me, to the west is the Ionian Sea. To the east is the Aegean Sea. And to the south is the Sea of Crete and also the Mediterranean Sea. What is most unique about the geography of Greece is that it is comprised of hundreds of little islands. And these islands uh, will develop their own systems of government as the centuries progress. But it's also very unique to see that this is the first civilization that doesn't develop near a river. We've seen the ancient Chinese civilizations develop uh, by the Yellow River. We've seen the ancient Egyptians develop by the Nile River. Uh, the ancient uh, Mesopotamians developed along the Tigris and Euphrates River. This is the first civilization of the ancients that is going to be, represent um, a civilization that is developed by the sea on a coastal plain. So, ancient Greece included Europe's Balkan Peninsula, which included a small rocky island uh, near and in the Aegean Sea. Okay, the geography protects the uh, Greeks from natural invaders. So all these islands, they're a natural barrier. Additionally, the geography isolates the islands and prevent a unified government. So a lot of the ancient Greeks will have different, what are called city-state forms of government, but no united front as yet. And as I said earlier, this is the first civilization that we learn about that does not, quote, grow up near a river. And it is the first civilization that's not united by one king, but they do share a similar polytheistic religion, language, and society. So, the Greeks 3.0, and why do I call them 3.0? Well, early on in ancient Greek uh, civilization, there were the Mycenaeans, the Myoans, early, early Greek civilizations. However, the later Greeks, when we think of great architecture and great philosophers, they, they are the later Greeks, the classical period, and that's what we're going to focus on uh, for this class. The two accomplishments, or the two main accomplishments of the Greeks of this era was that they developed, uh, or they had highly developed city-states that had different forms of government, but a shared common culture, and they made tremendous advancements in arts, science, literature, philosophy, government, and much more. There are four, uh, there's pictures and paintings uh, down below that you're going to need to know. Uh, the first, this is the Parthenon in Greece, a temple to the goddess, and we'll be discussing that in class. This right here is the ancient amphitheater where many dramatic plays and dramas and comedies were performed. And this we're going to talk about in class tomorrow. This is the most important statue in the history of, of art history. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So politically speaking, there are two main city-states, uh, Sparta and Athens. And when we think about the ancient Greeks, we think about these two city-states. Uh, they were rivals at each other. And the best rivalry I can say is it's almost like Egger Township versus mainland. It's a very close, a very big rivalry. So Sparta was located on the Peloponnesus Peninsula in southern Greece, while Athens was located more centrally in the Attica Peninsula. Sparta used war, they were very much warlike, and used um, the army to control their society. Whereas the Athenians were ruled by direct democracy, where every male citizen was given the right to vote. 
And this is important because this, the Athenians, are the first true democracy known to world to the world. Very important bullet point. I would make sure you star or highlight that somewhere in your notes. In Sparta, the boys and the men trained to be in the army. They were very big on defense, and the women were given a special diet so that they could produce strong and very healthy babies. Again, repopulating the idea of masculinity. The Athenians were free to travel to uh, and receptive to new ideas. And again, there's that idea of cultural diffusion. If you have a civilization that is more likely to travel and experience new things, much of what we know in life is based on our life experiences. And the more we travel, the more we experience. Sparta, very strict, very little freedom, no traveling, no outsiders were welcome. And the Athenians, as I said, developed the first written constitution plan of government. So there's all this fighting between Sparta and Athens, and between both of them, there's this great rivalry. But King Philip of the Second of Macedonia realizes that these two rivalries can be unified. So he begins to slowly unify parts of Greece, and he does this through the northern Balkan Peninsula. And Philip of Macedonia wants three things from his tenure. He wants to, one, create a strong army. Two, he wants to unify all the Greek city-states under Macedonian rule. And three, he wants to destroy the mighty Persian Empire. Now, the mighty, Mer the, the mighty Persian Empire comes just after the Babylonian Empire in the Middle East. So we really can't see it on this map, but the, Bab but the uh, ancient Persians are rivaling the Greeks. Unfortunately, Philip II only accomplishes two out of three of his goals. He does create a strong army. He unifies the Greek city-states under Macedonian rule. However, he's unable to destroy the Persian Empire. Unfortunately, he is assassinated. He is killed. And his son is left to finish the job. And we know his son becomes one of the greatest military leaders of all time. And that is Alexander the Great. Conqueror of the known world. So, Alexander the Great is 20 years old when he becomes king. Imagine that. That's roughly six or seven years older than some of you guys are right now. And he becomes king of the mighty empire. He's 12 years younger than Mr. Martyrone. It's a very young age to be the conqueror of the known world. Okay? He's also possibly the greatest general of all time. And he's known for never losing a battle and never losing a war. He picked his battles very carefully, and he picked the battles that he could win. And you can see the height in this map of his empire, extending from Greece in Europe through the Middle East, through what's now Turkey, around the Fertile Crescent, into Egypt, along the Nile, and then spreading through what's now modern-day Iraq, modern-day Iran, Afghanistan, all the way to the border of India. It's a pretty widespread empire. And here's Greece. And he stops at the border of India, not because he wants to, or excuse me, not because he has to, but because he wants to. He realizes it's much like a rubber, his empire is much like a rubber band. If you stretch it too far, it'll break apart. And if you stretch it too far, he will lose his power. So he realizes he's not going to go any farther. So Alexander the Great achieves his original goal. He conquers the Persian Empire. And then he builds a legacy. He creates his own empire. And what's unique about Alexander the Great is as he conquers a region, he makes that region part of his own empire. He improves upon that region and then moves on. He also diffuses many of the Persian uh, culturalistic traits. For example, style. He wears Persian clothes. He marries a Persian royalty, and he spreads the Greek language, knowledge, and culture. However, Alexander the Great dies. Uh, I think he, uh, history reports that he had a, uh, an infected gut, which caused him to die, and that ended the reign of Alexander the Great. The problem with this is that there's no one really strong to take over for Alexander, and his empire is divided amongst his generals, who are capable people, but they're no Alexander the Great. And as a result, 
his mighty empire begins to break and fall apart. Here's a map showing, depicting Alexander's great and mighty empire. You guys can see he began his conquest of Macedonia, moved through ancient Greece, then through what's now Syria, Gaza, Alexandria, and conquered Egypt, before heading out to, uh, east to Assyria, what's now modern-day Iran and Iraq, and all, do, all the way through the Hindu Kush. A very mighty empire. And that is your very brief introduction of ancient Greece. Now, it's very interesting uh, about this point of view in, in history is that the hundred of years that I just went over in just a couple minutes is actually the subject of many college courses. So if this is something that interests you, perhaps you could take a college course on classical Greece uh, when you guys attend college in a couple of years. Uh, if I went too fast, please feel free to uh, watch this video again. Make sure you have all the notes in your uh, Cornell packet on the political history of ancient Greece. And in class, we'll be discussing the societal changes and impacts of ancient Greece.